So we are jumping directly to the next session, which is presented by Dr. Sebastian Wiczorek, who is Vice President for AI Technology at SAP, and Dr. Daniel Neuhauser, who is Head of ERP Core Solutions at Villeroy and Boch. And they present their joint AI business transformation they did, um, and will present some business process automation use cases they developed together. The stage is yours. Yes, thanks uh, and uh, welcome from my side as well. I'm Sebastian Wiczorek uh, from SAP. With me, uh, Daniel Neuhäuser from Villeroy and Poch, uh, who will present shortly. Um, let me just uh, share my screen so you can see the slides that I'm looking at. That should be up now. And uh, what we uh, want to do is to uh, give you insights into a concrete uh, into a concrete case where uh, Villeroy Boch used existing uh, and, and, and uh, let's say innovative assets uh, from SAP to improve business processes on uh, on their own IT landscape. What I'm going to do is to give you a bit of uh, introduction to what SAP's uh, portfolio overall looks like, how we're uh, how our approach to AI is. But uh, this will be very brief, and the majority of time, uh, I would uh, like to hand over to Daniel so he can uh, give you a lot of, uh, I think, very interesting and, and meaningful insights into how this kind of uh, transformation works and what are the what are the benefits, what are the uh, potential obstacles, how did and, uh, and how did uh, Villeroy and Boch uh, tackle the uh, topic of uh, introducing AI. So starting uh, starting with the market overview, when we talk about AI, I think people have very different understanding of uh, of what it can do and where it can be used. And from from an SAP perspective, AI has three different facets. One is you have technology and you have AI platforms uh, uh, providing technology for people to, for data scientists mainly, to build up their own algorithms, to train them, to run inference uh, on them. Um, that is uh, that is one part of it. Then there's, of course, the uh, usage or, or the, uh, the application-specific AI utilization. So taking existing functionality or previous functionality, integrating that into applications and then calling this application an I enabled applications. And the third one is, of course, you can take other technology platforms and extend them with AI capabilities like you're extending the application part. Now, SAP is doing all of that. It's a big company. Uh, most of, uh, so we're, uh, we're having in investments in all three areas. But the prime target from our perspective is application embedded AI. So looking into how can we increase the uh, uh, the uh, intelligence of applications that we're providing to our customers so they don't have to um, deal with uh, AI implementation and integration projects. However, um, not every... Uh, not every product uh, is facilitating all these uh, tailor-made processes. So that's why you will hear how um, Villeroy and Boch handled that, uh, handled that situation. But in general, the idea is that uh, you, we at SAP, we have a product strategy with all our uh, front, uh, front and center products like business networks, industry cloud, uh, business process intelligence and sustainability management. Uh, and underneath you have the, the, all the products in this uh, category. Uh, taking that into consideration, there is a data strategy um, and there is an AI strategy following this uh, uh, or utilizing this data in order to augment the, uh, these products so that they can be used off the shelf and, and can be used uh, without uh, further tailoring by the customers. Uh, obviously, what needs to be done is that you have customer-specific training then of these assets, but the training routines then are part of the onboarding procedures. And on an uh, on an portfolio level, you see that uh, at the heart of this, at the heart of it, we have these uh, business applications that are integrated. Uh, as I said in the portfolio, they're uh, they're built based on AI functions, so components that we can reuse across our portfolio and running on the platform. 
that we're uh, providing internally for training models, serving models, doing lifecycle management and operation. And uh, within SAP, I'm responsible for this uh, AI for also have conversational AI, so chatbot capability, digital assistant capabilities, and we have intelligent robotic process automation, which is then uh, um, a meaningful means to also uh, integrate these AI functions into custom processes. Underneath, of course, we have the business technology platform uh, and other products uh, like SAP Data Intelligence and uh, SAP HANA that also facilitate uh, technology uh, snippets and, and technology parts that can be used to create AI functions or implement them. And with that uh, introduction, I'm uh, handing over to Daniel to provide us uh, some concrete uh, project overview, and then I will uh, close uh, with some final remarks. Yes, <clears throat> yes, thank you, and uh, welcome from my side as well. So. I would like to go one step back from a, from a solution perspective into more uh, generic approach. What is what is intelligent decision or what is intelligent automation and what's behind? So in the end, if you if you talk about process automation, in a, in a lot of cases it means automation of decision. And then the question is, what makes a decision intelligent? Um, what is the, what is the advantage of intelligent decision and and how could you implement such decisions? So to to simplify. We can we can distinguish two types of decisions: uh, rule based, based versus experiential. And I would like to explain shortly what's the what's the difference from from my perspective. So, a rule based it's it's the classical type. It's it's ifs and else decisions. So you have um, you have a more static setup. Of course, you can design very complex decision trees, but in the end, it's it's static. You have to design. Okay, if something happens, then do that or do something else. That has some advantages. For example, it's, it's traceable because you can normally understand based on which condition a decision was made. Um, it's mainly transactional uh, for for comparable approach. If you you talk about enhancement, like like custom coding or something. On the other side, uh, you talk about experiential decisions. So that's not not static anymore. That's a decision based on on pattern recognition. For example, so there you do not design a clear decision. Um, you you design a framework. You train an algorithm to uh, to decide on on the things you you would like to achieve, um, and then the algorithm classifies pattern, uh, calculates probabilities, uh, and hopefully you get the decision you uh, you wanted to have, or it's the right decision. So it's not not traceable anymore, not completely traceable, uh, but you can use uh, dynamic. At least partly unstructured data, process data, like uh, PF data or something, and at least in, in the most end-to-end -end processes, uh, I, I had a look on. Uh, there were some decisions which need experiential parts. So the main capability to handle unknown or partly unknown or only partly known situations. Um, in that case, you you need some experiential decision processes. And that's what you could see as as intelligence in the end. So, and if you if you go a step into process, of course, uh, an end-to-end -end process, you need the combination of both types. Um, it's normally possible, and it's it's normally as well beneficial. And what we do, we use intelligent RPA as a framework uh, to co to combine these uh, decision types and to automate processes. And that's the uh, that's the main approach. So we started with uh, with RPA, and uh, we developed into a Situations that we can switch between rule-based decision, which is, which is workflow design, um, and experiential decision, which is uh, algorithm uh, driven. So next slide, please. So to go one step, just one example. What is what is experiential decision uh, based on example uh, document classification? Um, this is a self-trained algorithm. So um, what we did, we needed to provide a sample set of training data. Uh, for each type of document, we um, we needed to have classified. So it's uh, for us, it's an invoice, uh, a GTC, a delivery note, a dunning letter. So everything, uh, each document we wanted to present to the to the algorithm should be classified into these into these types. So the training uh, we had to um, pre-classify manually 
some hundred uh, documents for each type just to explain okay if we present a document like that that's an invoice if we, if we present document like that that's a, a delivery note and uh, the better the, the quality of the training data is the better the algorithm works in the end with this initial training uh, we had to check is the uh, algorithm is the service working as we expected so we presented some unknown documents and checked the classification and now it's important to understand how this how this classification works um, for each document we present to the service we get an answer with a probability uh, with he detects a document so on the first line of the of the table in the in, in the right above um, the result was an invoice because it was 90% probability detected as an invoice. It could be a delivery note, it could be a dunning letter as well, but with very limited um, limited probabilities. And that, that we receive for each document we present. So what we had to define or what we had to find out with which threshold uh, a document is correctly classified. So, it's it's very it's very uncommon that you get 100% probability on this um, on the service because there are always pattern on each document which could be seen on an invoice and on a, del on, on a delivery note as well. So uh, in our case, for example, we had to define 60% threshold. So with a probability of 60 60 60%, um, it's a very high probability that the invoice is really an invoice as a classification result. So that doesn't that doesn't mean that we only detect 60% of the invoices, but we just we are far more, but we do not need 90% uh, probability on that. And that's the whole whole functionality, and that's the that's the service we embedded into our main use case. So and, uh, for that, I would like to introduce uh, Carl. Carl is an accountant, and uh, especially Carl is responsible to handle errors in a central invoice email folder. So uh, what does it mean in, in detail? Um, we have an automatic invoice processing, but uh, some, some gaps. So in, in some situations, uh, the current tool does not detect correctly. So especially if we have more than one document type in the email. So if we have emails with the delivery, note or delivery notes and uh, commercials or end invoices, um, it could not be processed automatically. So before, Oh, uh, <laughs> before um, that was done manually. So if you please go to the next slide. Uh, it was it was done manually. So the challenge was uh, we have attachments uh, which are not invoices. The manual task, um, somebody needs to check each attachment, um, open and check, is it an invoice? Is it a dunning letter? Is it a delivery note? Um, and need to combine them ma manually. For example, if we receive an invoice and delivery note in one email, we normally combine it into one PDF um, and then send it to processing because we want to archive uh, as well the delivery note. And if you if you remember uh, the the discussion before the explanation before, um, that's exactly a field of work for for classification algorithm. So we it's may it's quite easy because we do not have to extract information on the invoice. We just have to understand, is it an invoice or not? Um, so it's a, it's a quite quite good field of work for them. And um, <clears throat> that led us to the technical design on the, on the next slide, um, where, we, uh, where we had three main parts and uh, three parts of decisions. So in the, in the first step, we have a, a rule-based decision um, checking the email folder, which is quite easy. Check if an email is there, check if an attachment is there, uh, separate the attachment and um, present it to the algorithm, to the service. So then it was the experiential part. Um, we need to classify the, the document and we need to receive the classified document. So is it invoice, delivery note, whatever. And then in the third step, um, we had to implement some decision rules, what to do if we have uh, certain types of documents. But that's again static because it's always the same. If you receive an invoice and a delivery note, it's always the same decision. There's no, <clears throat> no complexity behind. 
And uh, now I would like to present the, the bot a bit more in detail. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't make sense to show a video because this bot is, is working totally unattended without uh, any any capturing or so. So it um, it's nothing which could be seen there. Uh, but if you could switch to the next slide. So now I, I just uh, describe the main four steps. So uh, as discussed, um, we receive some some error mails in an email folder, um, and uh, at the moment the, the bot is looping through the email folder each day. In the second step, um, we we collect all the documents, we check the att uh, attachment, and uh, we send to the classification service, and we handle the service response, so the response, so classical RPA task. Uh, in the next step, uh, it's presented to the uh, to the service. And we get the, the answer for each document, which is the, which is a classification type, um, and then we can we can handle in the fourth step uh, the corresponding corresponding result. Um, so that's a decision about the document type. It's a combination and deleting of documents. For example, um, <clears throat> GTC we normally delete because we don't need it. Um, invoice and delivery notes we combine, and the dunning letter we um, we forward to the to the correct email address. And then this corrected invoice, because that's our core type, um, we present again to our, our current um, interpretations tool, and then it's working normally. So that's in, in productive usage since six or eight months. So it's uh, it works quite stable, and it works um, very, um, very sustainable. And I just prepared some, some figures how to to, to understand what's the, what's the benefit and what's the impact on our process. So um, we have we have one, just to compare, um, we have one smaller bot who is just checking some, some log files. So it's uh, quite easy. He's opening a log file, checking for the dedicated type of words and uh, deciding based on that. So classical uh, rule-based. Um, and there we work with around about 98% automate, automation rate. For this, uh, what I described before, based on experiential uh, decisions, we are at the moment on an automation rate of 91%. 91%. So uh, only 9% of the cases, there's manual rework needed, which is not meaning that the, that the classification is not working, it's uh, as well, the major part that we receive, for example, two invoices and two delivery notes in one mail. Um, and that's one of the cases we could not handle automatically at the moment. But just from a, from a nearly from the beginning, we had around about 90% uh, of, the, of the manual work who could be automated. And that one dimension is around about four and a half thousand documents a year. So to, to come to the end, was what was were our success criteria for uh, for that? Um, it, it sounds simple, but it's it, it's like that. So we need a we, for us it was beneficial that we had a clear and manageable scope. Uh, we didn't have a business critical use case, um, which makes sense. If it's the first step to uh, to jump into some AI services, it was decoupled uh, from other processes. So um, we have no limitations. So if something's going wrong or might go wrong. There's no uh, major dependency to another process. It's uh, it's decoupled, and we we have to focus on the on the core business case. So what was the business case? Automate the major part of the of the document classification, and um, that simplifies the the discussion as well. In the in the second step, expectation management. Of course, uh, we had every time we involved the end user, we showed the the advantages, the disadvantages. We showed in the early stage. The uh, classification results, even if they were, if they were not perfect in, in the first step, but it helped that everybody understood how this uh, service is working and uh, what is the potential of this of this service. And of course, uh, in a in a third point, proof of concept. The first thing we did before we started is developing the bot, is showing that the classification service is working. And after we could uh, prove that, uh, we started with the rest of the of the project. 
Thanks, Daniel. And uh, let me take over here. I think um, I just uh, want to uh, wrap it up here. What you have seen is, uh, and I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoyed it, is uh, a case uh, how one of our customers, Wille Boch, used the uh, AI product portfolio here, the document classification and RPA part, in order to innovate on their own business processes. And I think when we look at the uh, key takeaways. I would like to uh, just highlight um, that uh, one, I uh, tried to explain briefly how SAP is injecting AI into own business processes and uh, uh, second, um, how it's possible uh, that companies are able to take these, uh, these components to innovate on their, uh, in their own processes as well. And uh, third, you have seen that uh, Villo and Boch is doing exactly that and is uh, in that way becoming an intelligent enterprise by uh, introducing intelligent uh, features and functions into their own business processes. And with that, we're at the end of the talk. Uh, Daniel and I will be very happy to answer your questions if you have any. And here you see uh, some links and also our email addresses in case you want to learn more. Thanks a lot for the insights. We just uh, hand over one question from the chat to you, um, whoever wants to answer it. It's about autonomous industrial processes and your views regarding this. And if you, um, if we're not there yet, um, given this um, autonomous industrial processes question, uh, what would it demand for further advancements of AI to come to this industrial autonomous industrial processes in this context? Daniel, do you want to have a go, or should I answer? Maybe, no, you could start first, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's a very broad-ended question and it's it, of course, depends, right? So you have processes that are uh, that can be fully automated. Um, and I think that uh, what uh, Daniel has been showing, I think, especially in when, when the... Uh, Uh, when rule-based approaches have uh, such uh, significant input in, uh, impact already, I think in those processes you can uh, you can think about full automation. But then there are processes um, completely automated, especially when you see that regulations at the moment are uh, coming up that are demanding human oversight at, uh, at uh, certain points of the interaction. So I think yes, we will see an, an increase in an automation. I think full automation, I mean, yeah, company, uh, car manufacturers were dreaming about the fully automated uh, plant and now are going back to introduce more, uh, um, let's say, manual uh, manual working steps uh, in their in their facilities as well. I think it's going to be, in most cases, uh, a combination of human oversight or human interaction and processes. But, uh, of course, we will see much more automation because the, the technologies and tools that are uh, present and that are available right now are not used in, to the extent they could be used. So I think AI, and that's my uh, my core belief, is going to lead to a wave of automation. But it's not going to be the, 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 the result and the, the goal to fully automate every single process or a single process, but to automate Uh, steps in these processes and uh, allow people, allow humans to focus on the meaningful steps that uh, you don't want to or you are not able to automate. Daniel, you're... Yeah, so from uh, I, I agree fully. And uh, from, from my perspective, uh, we, we, do, we try to not to have the target to automate a process 100%. Because what, what we learned, that's uh, the last 10, 15% in automation are the most time consuming and the most cost effective. So uh, it's really that, that we start with a classical 80-20 rule, <clears throat> bringing some benefits. And, and then if the if an, if an process is running and the automation is running, maybe there's time or chance for improvement. But uh, fully automation, it's, uh, I guess it's very, yeah, very, very complex in the end because each process has some edge cases, some, some special rules which nobody knows, which are coming up once or twice a year. Thanks a lot for all those insights. And uh, as you said, as you've um, said in your final conclusions, feel free to to the participants of the talk. Feel free to connect to the colleagues and to, to interact on the, the upcoming time of this Big AI Summit and also after the conference. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Bye. See you.